Hello, everybody. Welcome to Todd and John's Monday Night Therapy Session. And if you're wondering why, the caption says Todd and John, and then the little video says John and Todd, it's because I know that that drives Greg completely insane that I mix those back and forth. Because last week he said, uh, get this sequence right. And I'm like, what? I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> How are you doing, Todd? Oh, John, um, I'm not so sure you and I should be the ones providing the therapy. I'm, I think I am in, in his need, in, in, I have his, a greater need than a lot of people to, for, for some therapy. So why, why do you say this, Todd? Oh, my goodness. Well, yeah, I just, with all that has transpired, and, you know, the reality is, is that the team we love, the team we have made a lifelong commitment to, in good times and bad, we still have eight more weeks of football. And normally, <laughs> I would want to say, we have eight more weeks of football. And I'm just sitting here thinking, gosh, if, if, if this could be the longest eight weeks uh, of my lifetime, I, I, I don't know. Um, I hope not. I hope, I hope some good things transpire. And, uh, you know, we're going to talk about some of those. Um, but, uh, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll see where we go. Well, you know, normally it seems like football season goes very fast. And then uh, this year it seems like maybe it won't go so fast, especially if one thing happens. Well, a few and things what happen. Would that, what well, would that the, number, the number one thing I'm afraid of is that we have to spend eight weeks talking about uh, the who the new coach is going to be. Well, I tell you what, uh, I, that's one of the things on my list – we can speculate all we want, but that's going to make for an incredibly long eight weeks. It is. It'd be like we're back in the pandemic and we're like, what are we going to come up with? <laughs> There's well, no sports. What I would can, you say, imagine, can you imagine doing a talk radio show in Lincoln, Nebraska right now? I mean, like literally coming up with stuff day after day after day. That'd be worse than the off season because there's no, I mean, right now we have stuff tonight. Uh, do you want to tell you, do, do you have anything else to say about that? Or should I ask you your first question? Well, say about the coaching situation or you want me to talk about Oklahoma or where, where are you headed? The, the eight weeks, the, the eight, eight weeks. weeks of horror. Okay. Talk anything to me about else? This. Well, the, the, the thing that I, I think about the eight weeks that we have in front of us is that, None of us have any idea about where things are going to go, but I think the vast majority of people are looking at this in a pretty pessimistic manner. And why wouldn't we? Um, I, I think the hope lies with what's going to transpire over the course of the next two weeks. And if any of us thought that Mickey Joseph was going to be able to come in and wave some kind of a magic wand and all of a sudden we're going to be at Oklahoma, um, you know, or, you know, win out or whatever it might be. I think that's wishful thinking. I think that, you know, the, the, there, there's the, the situation is, is not conducive to that, but I think that there can be some positives coming up. And so I guess that does make me a little bit excited and, and we'll just have to see, you know, with the eight weeks where, where they go. Okay. you you went to the Oklahoma game. You were in the crowd you yep. were there for the electricity of, you know, Nebraska versus Oklahoma. Uh, Nebraska looked like, oh, my God, this is going to be a game in the first, I don't know, four minutes. And then uh, and then Dylan Gabriel went off for a 61-yard run. Yeah. I mean, I'm going to ask you about your Oklahoma game experience from a crowd perspective and, and feelings because – we're, we're okay. It's okay. We're old men and we can have feelings and, and express them. But let me ask you this. Did that 61 yard by, run by Dylan Gabriel just break this team in that game? Yes, it did. Um, because they, they, uh, they played, you know, decent up to that point, you know, um, let me, let me take a couple steps back though. Going into that game, 
um, there was quite a bit of enthusiasm. There was some excitement in the stadium, and it kind of seemed like, you know, a, a typical Oklahoma-Nebraska game to a large extent. Now, you know, I used to remark years ago that an hour before kickoff, you know, 75, 80 percent of the crowd was already in the stadium. And, and, you know, under those kinds of circumstances, if OU was in town, you know, that buzz started about 30 minutes before kickoff. You could feel the intensity. Wasn't quite to that extent, but as as game time came closer and, um, you know, what what really sparked the crowd was was Mickey Joseph. You know, when the team was out there doing their warm up and as they're kind of bringing their warm up to a conclusion before they go back in the locker room, you know, Mickey Joseph's getting animated. I mean, you know, he's 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 I, I don't know what he's saying, but dang, you know, he's trying to get these guys pumped up. And I'm sure he's talking about how important, you know, the, the Nebraska-Oklahoma rivalry is. And and you could, you know, the, the fans could see him out there, you know, pumping his fists and being animated and all that kind of stuff. And, and people were cheering that. I mean, you know, that's, I guess, a different way to look at this. Oh, my God, we've gotten to the point where we're cheering a coach showing some emotion. Um, <laughs> but, but, you know, there was that electricity in the crowd. And then, you know, shoot, we hold Oklahoma. And um, uh, then, then we walked down the, the, the field and score and looked pretty doggone sharp. And then, you know, the next Oklahoma series, we held them. They had third down, and all of a sudden, yeah, you're right. Dylan Gabriel takes off on that 61-yard run and uh, ball game. I mean, ball game. They, yeah. It seemed like, you know, they folded the tent at that point. And uh, I think on the next possession – you know, Nebraska was three and out, and I'm sure that there was one sack in that possession, maybe two. Um, but, you know, the, the bottom line is, and, and you've said this on a couple of occasions since the game, Oklahoma could have named their score. They could have named their score. Yeah. I mean, they could have, they could have hung, they could have hung 75 on us. Um, you know, let alone old Barry Switzer's hang half a hundred. Well, they, they could have hung half a hundred on us in the first half if they'd wanted to. But, um, you know, it, it, that that did break our backs, in my opinion. And, you know, the crowd hung with it for a while. People did leave at halftime. But in the third quarter, uh, there was still a decent crowd there in the third quarter. And I think that they were hoping something positive was going to happen. And then the offense just could not uh, get unstuck. And um, Oklahoma just, yeah, they, they just did you, did you, toyed with us. Did you go back and watch the game? No, I tend not to go back and watch games. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't. I don't know what to say about the game. I mean, number one is the number six team in the nation, so I guess you can go. Well, we got beat up by possibly a very good team, but we said pretty. We kind of made the excuse after Northwestern. Uh, oh, they have good offensive line. Oh, they were. You know, they're going to be a good team. They're going to win the West. And then they got beat by Southern Illinois this weekend. You know, Georgia <laughs> Southern gets beat by UAB. Uh, and our, I think what bothered me is our our offensive tackles are barely – they don't even function. Like, they literally do not function. And so if, it's almost if, – if uh, nobody's coached them, nobody's taught them anything. I keep saying the same thing over and over. God, you know, I hate beating up Bryce Benhart, but there was one play where he's got a guy on his inside shoulder and a guy on his outside shoulder. Who's he block? The guy on the outside I'm pretty, shoulder. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that when you have a guy to your inside, you normally you got to block him first because he's closer to the quarterback, you know, just by angles. And he blocked basically nobody, and that gave up a sack where Casey Thompson had like. No time. Is it like 0.2 seconds? You know, I mean, if we have pass plays where we can get the ball out and gain yardage in 0.2 seconds, I'm for that. Well, for the rest of the season. There's something, you know, the offensive line is bad and and they were bad last year. And, you know, we've got good players or excuse me, our better players. Some of our better players are injured and they're not and they're not playing. Um, But some something's going on there with, with the, with that bunch and whether it's physical or whether it's mental, I mean, you know, if you don't feel good about what you're doing, if you don't have some confidence, it's kind of hard to drag that 325 pounds 
along, you know, to, to, to stick with it. And I'm not saying that they're soft. I'm not saying that they're weak between the ears. You know, there's none of that, but it's, it is very frustrating, you know, to continue to watch these guys get manhandled. That being said, and, you know, I'm not going to sit here and put anybody on, you know, the award stand, but at times Nebraska has run the ball quite well. And, you know, is that due to the fact that Anthony Grant and AJ Allen are just that much better running back than what we've had in the last couple of years? Gabe Urban or Gabe Irvin had some nice runs in the second half. You know, I, I, I think that there are some positives there, but, it, to me, that that offensive line, to, it looks to me like they lack that tenacity. They lack that just you got to be a mean son of a gun out there on the offensive line. But they just don't look like they move. You know, they're uh, Oklahoma, you know, but geez, Oklahoma's athletes on defense. Um, they're going to cause disruption for a lot of teams. There's a lot of offensive lines that are going to struggle if Venables decides to throw the whole kitchen sink at them. Um, so, yeah, it, it is what it is. Eric Janander is fired. I mean, I did a reaction video so people can go see that. And, uh, uh, you know, I gave what I thought about it. Oh, I forgot to plug my my store. Uh, what do you think about the Eric Janander situation? I really don't know. I'm, I'm, uh, I, I, yeah, I think it needed to happen. Um, you've got, you're going to give Bill Bush two weeks to try to improve tackling, um, to try to reinforce uh, gap discipline, maybe to make some adjustments in personnel. Um, maybe to change some attitudes. Um, you know, there's, uh, why not? I guess, why not? I know that a lot of people said, well, what good does it do to get rid of him now? You know, why don't you just make him right out the season? Well, you know, I don't want to say that Mickey's coaching for his professional life because I don't think he is. Uh, we can talk more about the hypothetical of Mickey Joseph going forward, but um you know, something had to happen to shake things up. You can't we, – we've seen the same thing from Shenander's defenses since since he got here. Um, you know, it is – I think it was, it was a necessary move. Well, Bill Bush is promoted to defensive coordinator, also handling special teams. What, what I thought was surprising was – gosh, excuse me that they didn't promote. I mean, I don't know if they have analysts or grad assistants. They can promote to a paid position coach to, to, because they have now a coaching slot open, but um, and Bill Bush has had a long career. He's been a safeties coach. I think he was a co-defensive coordinator somewhere. He's been a co. I didn't look and he's, been, he's been a defensive coordinator, three different places. Well, there you go. So he, it's not exactly like he's never done this before. It's just a pretty tall order to figure it out. In uh, you know, I, I guess you look at this and you kind of go, the bye week came at the proper time. You know, um, they have at least two weeks before they can straighten out their coaching staff and and hopefully, hopefully do something. Apparently, they haven't done in four years. Todd beat Iowa. Tackle and practice. Oh. Because we all saw, we all saw the Mar Miles Farmer quote about yeah. uh, what did he say? Tagging off four tagging years off. of practice, tagging off and not doing tackling, and we wonder why in the hell the defense isn't any good. Uh, you know, you can't play at game speed without tackling. No, you got to tackle, and and you can't you you can't tag and tag and tag, and then all of a sudden turn it on during the game and tackle. I mean, it's a whole different yeah. kind of a mindset. I, I was listening to, you know, Hale Varsity this, this afternoon driving back, and, and George Darlington was on there. And, you know, George Darlington, you know, said, you know, there was a time when teams took a great deal of pride in, in being a good tackling team. And he says there yeah. are some good tackling teams out there. And he said, and 
you know, this might surprise some people. He said the best tackling teams that he's seen in the last 10 to 15 years have been Illinois when Lovey Smith was the head football coach at Illinois because Lovey Smith can teach players to tackle better than any other coach out there. That's George Darlington. So he's older than you and me, so by God, that means he's got to be senile or something. <laughs> but, the but the reality uh -huh. is that you have to tackle in practice, and it also instills a mindset. And uh, it, it sounds like they started some of that last week. And I've got to believe that there's going to be a lot of tackling over the next over the course of the next few days. Mickey Joseph said in his press conference, they're going to do a lot of drills. They're not going to do teamwork this week. They're going to do drills. You got to improve fundamentals. Players got to get better at their own personal skills so they can contribute when they're needed. And I, I something else that I, I thought was kind of interesting Somebody said, yeah, back in the old Tom Osborne days, of course, you know, we've got all these Tom Osborne alums throwing their two cents in. But back in the Osborne days, they hated the off weeks. If they didn't have a game on Saturday, they said those were absolutely the worst practices, worse than preseason practices. They hated them. So I've got to believe that we're going to have a lot of players on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday this week that are probably going to be taking ice baths because I think they're going to be pretty physical practices this week, and they're going to find out who wants to play football for the University of Nebraska. All right, we'll take some pieces here. Rob says, didn't Pliny also have non-tackling practices? Here's how mostly, most people do, do this, okay? What happens is you, you practice tackling in the spring. I, I watched Adam Carricker's live show last night, and he talked about – spring ball and you tackle and you beat each other up because you have months to months to recover and, and feel better about it. And he talked about how uh, the no tackling in the spring game dro drove him crazy. But normally what happens is teams do this. When they go to fall practice, they start tackling because they have to prepare their bodies for this season, basically. I, and I talked to, you know, could play uh, well pro and then play in college and what they're doing is they're basically conditioning their bodies for violence. I mean, that sounds pretty blunt, but that's what it is. They're also getting used to game speed and they're also getting used to hitting people. And then when the season starts, you don't tackle pretty much at all in practice because, you know, you're getting beat up in the games and the games are more physical than they've ever been. Uh, even with all the new rules, there's these guys just beat the shit out of each other and you don't normally tackle throughout the season. Because you don't want to take people that are beat up and beat them up any more than they already are. So uh, if Pelini had non-tackling practices, you know, it probably was during the season. So I think every coach did that. Let's say, uh, you know what, I, I saved some. I've learned how to save comments, Todd, so we well, can good. get to them later. Good. Fred, Sack Fred Sacco says, is a Chenander firing simply addition by subtraction? Or did this D have a legit chance of improving with Bush at the helm? Okay. You want to you wanna take that? You well, want me to? I, I, well, I'll just say this, and then you can expand on it, because I hopefully we're on the same page here. I think that they can improve. I think that they have room to improve. So addition by subtraction? Yeah, possibly. Um, but uh, the coaching staff is not – just going to wave a white flag on this season. And I believe that they are going to do, well, at least the head coach and now the defensive coordinator are going to do whatever is necessary to salvage what they can from this season. All right. Chenander firing simply addition by subtraction. You know what I thought of? I, I have spent my career in life being an IT consultant. That is not football, just in case you didn't know it. Most people will go, well, you work on computers. Okay. One of the things I've done a lot in my career, not so much anymore, but was to go into companies and take over projects that were failing. And when you go into a project that's failing, I, by the way, I've mentioned before, I love doing that. I'd rather take over something that's failing than something that's running perfectly because all you can do is fuck it up. If it's failing, you can at least make it better. They can just fire you and go on to the next thing. But here's the thing. You go into a company where a project's failing, what you have to figure out as quickly as possible is 
uh, who's the champions. There's a whole list of this stuff, but mostly one of the things you have to figure out is this. Are the people on this project team actually helping? Are they hurting? Are they dragging their feet? Do they not want to do this? And then you figure out if they are not really in favor of doing any of the project stuff, uh, how am I going to deal with them? Am I going to ask the person I'm working for, could we remove them from this and put them on something else? Uh, could we give them something that's busy work just to keep them busy that we act like is important? Because that was a good tactic I used all the time. I usually went into companies and found out who the biggest whiners were uh, because I loved those people. They would tell me everything that was wrong. But when you let's say addition by subtraction, and this is speculation only. What I got to believe is, you know, Mickey Joe has looked at this and said, here are the new rules we're going to abide by, and everybody has to do that. And if you're a coach for four years that was used to, uh, you know, I don't know, maybe showing up late for work. I heard somebody did that sometimes. But if you're a guy that was not all in on everything and you happen to be a coach, you needed to go because you're not helping the project. That's how I saw it. I don't know that Eric Chenander was that guy, but Mickey Joseph, like Todd said, it, he is he is auditioning for a head coaching job, whether it's in Nebraska or somewhere else. He is showing off his skills. And what you want to do is, I, you know, to be honest with you, I'm going to have simple projects, and I don't give two shits with your feelings. I don't care if you don't like doing this. And one of the things, you know, I have to deal with people because I was an outsider and they'd look at me and go, uh, you know, why are we doing this? I don't want to do this. And why are you even here? You're just a consultant that's sucking money. And, you know, the the big stick I usually was, uh, was one time I looked at a guy and I said, uh, we're doing this because your boss said we're fucking doing it. And if you don't want to fucking do it, I can go tell your boss you don't want to do it. That's fine with me. I don't give a shit if you're here or not. Whether I'm external or not matters not. But you literally have to go, okay, this is rule time. This is how we're going to work. This is either going to be successful or fail. And I'm I'm pretty sure Mickey Joseph does not want to fail. Uh, I, I talked a lot. I got all energetic. Uh, well, okay. Brand M.M., John, have you seen 93.7? The tickets call in from tight end great Johnny Mitchell. No, I have not. But we're going to look it up later because Johnny Mitchell was my one of my favorite Huskers of all time. I just threw that in there, Todd. Well, um, uh, okay. Turner Gill was one of my favorite Huskers of all time, but I don't think he should come back and be a head coach at Nebraska. No. Uh, okay. Wait a minute. I just had one here. Okay. Randy Pappas says, hi, guys. Did we sell our so to go from a 3-4 to a 4-3 to get Othron Mathis, although he's been good? I think we've talked about this on the show with Haas. I guess I can leave that up there a bit. Um, I think that the whole 3-4, 4-3 thing, uh, you know, you kind of line up depending upon the opponent you're playing. You know, Georgia Southern probably wasn't going to run the ball. <laughs> I guess none of this matters now, does it? Our defense doesn't exist. You know what I think we have for a lineup, Todd? We have like an O11. That's what it an is. O11. <laughs> yeah, there's nobody even on the line. They're just all five <laughs> yards off the ball at this point. I don't know. They it just looks so bad. They I I don't know how if if Mickey Joseph can actually uh, save any of this, it'll be like he's a wizard, and we're gonna well, make wizard shirts. My level of ignorance is probably going to come to the surface here real fast. So I'm going to keep this short and sweet. I think one of the things that is that the three, four depends upon is that big old fella there in the middle that gobbles up linemen that forces interior linemen to double and triple team. And Nebraska doesn't have that guy and they haven't had that guy. And so I, I think that you're seeing more even fronts on defense. Basically, that's a reflection of the players that we have. All right. We got Linda Wilkins. None of this matters. The season for Nebraska starts on October 1st against Indiana. That's that's the way to look at it at this point. I mean, what's yeah. done is done. You know, we're, we're a one in three team at this point. And, uh, uh, 
you, you got to the, what's the most important game of the season? It's the next one. It's Indiana. You know that we could still win the West. <laughs> <laughs> You know, the other thing that we've continued as <laughs> Nebraska fans, many Nebraska fans have continued to to believe is that you can run before you walk. <laughs> we need to crawl. We need to master crawling before we can concern ourselves with championships. Okay. D did you see the picture I posted of my wall, my TV wall? I was going to post yeah, it here, but I forgot that. that. You I forgot to upload it. I, I forgot to upload it to this uh, software we're still trying to learn. But for everybody, uh, I sat down today to play video games because when I take breaks from my work, I, I like to kill fake people. It makes me feel better. And I look up at the TV, and there's usually a little, like a board sign to the next of it you can put letters on. And it's usually got a Bible verse from my wife that's inspirational. And I look up and I see, what what do I see? I see go gophers row the boat ski you ma on my wall my wall that right son of yours you know what the other son did the what other, the other son, son uh, the other son on saturday uh, created a profile on our corn nation site called john's least favorite son and apparently spent his afternoon on Saturday commenting on our website for people that were for a coach. Um, <laughs> oh, I just <laughs> and I wondered, I saw that I saw that you know John's least favorite son. I thought, I wonder if that's Noah. And it was. <laughs> okay. <sighs> da, 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 da. Fred Sacco again says the most frustrating thing is how weak the West is and how we fought in our way to the bottom. <laughs> God, this is so true. It's it, it it's honestly it's it's really sad at the opportunities in Nebraska is is missing. Um, have you watched all the West teams play? Uh, not all? all of them. I've seen some of them play. Of course, I've seen that brilliant offense in Iowa City. Um, you know. Who is the best team in the West? Is it Minnesota? I think, yeah, right now it is. Yeah, but they haven't played hardly anybody. But you know what? They have played them convincingly. I mean, they've run them over quite handily, and they really haven't even you know been made to breathe hard at this point. Yeah, um, I haven't watched much Wisconsin. Wisconsin, you know, lost to Washington, and I think that Paul Christ, you know, his seat is getting hot because he's gotten them to a certain point, but he hasn't gotten any further. Uh, right. But right now I'd, I'd say it's Minnesota just by default because Purdue, they just can't get out of their own way. Uh, Illinois, Northwestern. I mean, they lost to Southern Illinois. Uh, who else we got? I'm missing somebody. Oh, well, you got uh, Iowa and you got, yeah. Uh, you yeah. Got, yeah. Uh, yeah. It's not a good league this year. It is not. No. <laughs> No, it's terrible. You know, so I guess the question I have for you, John, is, you know, here we sit and, you know, you, where, where do things go next? What, what, what do you think, what's your crystal ball telling you? And I'm not just telling you, I'm just not saying, you know, for the Indiana game. And, I, you know, we're not talking coaches. I mean, this, this whole coaching speculation is going to drive people absolutely bonkers. I'll, I'll tell you, here's a, here's a challenge from me to all of you folks that are interested in who the next coach is. Go to Corn Nation and read the fan post. Um, that is the most complete list <laughs> of potential coaches that I've ever seen put together for any job in football. And, uh, you know, the gentleman that wrote it, uh, he goes into quite a bit of depth with each one of those potential coaches, but you know, what, where do you see things going, John? What, what, where are we going to end with this? End with, end with this. You mean this season? Well, no, where, where, where do we go from here? Where, where does this season go? 
Are we one in 11 team? Or you know, what's the I, future I, I, okay. of Nebraska football? I think the future of Nebraska football has to be worked on in the background of parts that we're never going to see and probably not know much about. Uh, we've already seen some of those, uh, you know, stories come out about that guy that used to be our coach. I don't really care about those. I think we should just move on for a while. We have plenty of an off season coming up that we can talk about that stuff. But here's what I think is important. And you saw the news lately that Nebraska has set up a new nil collective, right? The name, image, and likeness collective called the Big Red something based out of Omaha. I think that you need to get that all set up, all that organizational stuff. I see people constantly comment about recruits not wanting to come to Nebraska, uh, recruits not wanting to stay because Scott Frost is gone or their fo- coaches are fired. Here's the: This is a new world that we're living in. And you might as well look at it as a mini NFL. And I brought this up several times, Ryan Day saying that you need $13 million a year in nil money to compete, okay? Nebraska needs to spend their time, Trev Alberts needs to spend their time right now figuring out what that structure is going to look like. Because you can still, I mean, you're not supposed to use nil for recruiting, but nobody, the NCAA never set up any really good guidelines to it. So that's kind of what it's going to be used for. So if you have the money to offer the four-star quarterback guy and you actually go see his family and not blowing them off, uh, and you offer him a deal, uh, like a deal, and he goes, you know what? I That's a good deal, but uh, guess what? It, somebody else offered me 50 grand more in a car. Okay, well, then maybe you may, that's the kind of stuff that has to happen now. It's not just going to be about a guy that people love and he's a great recruiter. It's going to be about what are you going to give me? Because these kids are now at the point that they, they are kind of like, okay, I'm going to get paid to play football if I'm good enough. And you really, that structure needs to be in place for Nebraska. And that structure needs to be in place for Nebraska not just because we're going to use it for recruiting, but you're going to look at the next coach that everybody's like, who's the next coach? Uh, the next coach that comes in and say, guess what we have? We have $10 million this year to spend on Neil deals. And it's guaranteed by these guys over here. And the next coach will go, well, I don't think anybody else in the Big Ten West has that because if you look down the list of the Big Ten West, Todd, do you think Minnesota is going to have ten million dollars in nil deals? Minnesota is not going to be able to. Minnesota is not going to be able to keep pace. They won't. Right, right, because they don't have the will to do that. It's not that important to them. The Vikings are on in a little bit, if not playing right now. Uh, is Iowa going to be able to do that? Probably not. Uh, Northwestern, no. You know, you go down the list. Who else in the Big Ten West is going to do that? Who else is going to have that benefit? Probably no one. So when you look at a new coach and you say, "Guess what? We're going to help you with recruiting because we have shit tons of cash and nobody else does in our division," you're going to want to come to Nebraska and coach football. And the big problem, since I, I hate to bring this up. The big problem with Urban Meyer as our next coach is this. I'm going to leave his character out of this, and we won't even go there. What I see is if everybody says he can win, he can win, he can win. Okay, his big problem is this. He is used to being a dictator with his players, and he's used to dealing with college students. We saw what happened when he went to the NFL, and he couldn't push people around. Okay, he hasn't coached in college since 2018. He won't be able to push college players around like he used to because of the Neil thing. He's dealing with people who have the same mentality as NFL players when he comes back into college coaching, if he does. And this is why Urban Meyer should not be a candidate in Nebraska because the risk for him to fail is way too large. It's way much bigger than any other coach that we're looking at. And if you don't, if you don't understand that, uh, I'm not, well, you know, we'll cover it somewhere else. That's all I'm going to say about that. I've talked long enough, haven't I? (sighs) Well, you know, it's, we're living in interesting times. And, you know, when people say, um, 
you know, that how much how much the sport has changed. Well, you know, many aspects of the sport have changed. And, you know, to call it the Wild West, you know, could in fact be an understatement because nobody knows where, where a lot of this is going to end up. Nebraska is determined to be a player. And as long as Nebraska, you know, can get people to reach in their wallets and subsidize the program, um, you know, they're going to continue down that path. Now, do we have the right people in place to make the kinds of decisions that need to be made to upgrade a program? And, uh, you know, people are banking that Trev Alberts is the right guy, you know, leading the athletic department. And uh, up until this point in time, he hasn't done anything to change my mind. Uh, he just needs to get the right head coach in here. And we're going to see what's going to unfold. I guess one thing I want to say, and, I, you know, before we move on and, and, you know, we can take this question in just a minute, but, you know, where does Mickey Joseph sit in all of this? Um, you know, there were people that uh, a lot of people made some comments about his presser right after the football game where, you know, he was he was taking all the responsibility. You know, it's on me. It's on me. It's on me. I didn't. We didn't work hard enough. It's on me. We didn't. I didn't make them good enough tacklers. It's on me. I mean, you know, a lot of that coach speak. But there's a couple of ways that, you know, I want to a couple of things I want to say about that, that I, I hope open kind of, you know, get people to think a little bit. First of all, anybody associated with the program and anybody that understands how college football or for that matter, high school football, high school sports, college sports work. It's not all on the coach. And he isn't, you know, the, the players, when they interviewed three players after they talked to Coach Joseph, you know, they all said, no, we're responsible. We're responsible. But the message that Mickey Joseph sent is kind of twofold. First of all, his predecessor rarely took full responsibility for what happened on the field. And Mickey Joseph is trying to establish the fact that we aren't making excuses we're not pointing fingers. We're going to hold people accountable. We're going to stand up and, and, and stand for something. And, you know, that, that, that came through pretty strong. The other thing is, is that it's on me. It's on me. That's a little bit of code speak. And the code speak is he's talking to his players. He's talking to his players and he's saying, I'm going to take the heat for you guys this week. But damn it, you better step up and be accountable too. And so I have to believe that there is going to be a significant amount of holding each other accountable. Are you on board? Are you in for this 100%? Those things are going to be handled over the course of the next 10 days in practice. I salute Mickey Joseph for taking that stand. Yeah, that's he's in a hard place. David Wee says Nebraska isn't going to compete with Alabama, Texas, Texas AM and M for nil money. You're delusional if you think so. Well, no one has ever accused me of being delusional. <laughs> okay. Okay. We don't have to compete with Alabama, Texas, or Texas AM. We have to compete with the rest of the Big Ten West right now. If you want to get a program turned around quickly, that's who you have to beat out for recruits. So we're not we're not talking about going way to the top. We're talking about in the next two to three years, getting good recruits that want to come to Nebraska and play good enough football to late win the Big West 10 West division for however long the divisions last. And then we're going to see a 12-team playoff uh, coming into this. So here's how the what you're going to see is I firmly believe that if you bring in a coach and he has the right structure and you have the Neil structure in place and he's successful, then who likes to give, who likes to be around successful people? Everybody. And somebody last week, I think sent me an email that said million Omaha has more millionaires theirs per capita than I don't know what the hell that meant. But uh, I think that if you have success, David, that the, uh, the money will come. You know that's not out of the that's not out of the realm. Nebraska is still one of the biggest brands in football, and you know if you can get into a twelve team playoff, I think everybody will look at you and say uh, that's a successful thinking. You know for the year. Let's see. Uh, okay, 
John, you're wrong. Robert Noble says, John, you're wrong. Nobody ever says that to me either. <laughs> uh, you can't let college players run the program. Urban Meyer is the right kind of discipline guy. You're telling me Nick Saban doesn't run his kids in program. Well, I'm telling you this, uh, Nick Saban can look at his guys and say, you know what, if you don't like this, there's four other five-star tack defensive tackles that are willing to play. Nick Saban is not begging for scraps. And I don't want to say Nebraska is exactly at the point. Are we begging for scraps, Todd? Are we to that point yet? <laughs> I'm going to take the I'm, – I'm, no comment. No comment. Yeah. So I think that, you know uh, – does Nick Saban run his program the same way? No, because he's Nick Saban. But I do think that there is – put it this way. Before nil, college football players had no power. Now football players have power because they can look at this and say, you know what, if you don't, if you don't want to give me what I want, uh, I'll go somewhere else. And that's the, that's the fact, the way things are. And coaches that you, you're going to have to play a little bit more. It's not a matter of you get to do whatever you want. You still have to be a team guy, but you can't just basically do what Urban Meyer did for most of his career, which was pretty much threaten players, you know, play. You're not going to get a scholarship. I'm going to yank your scholarship stuff, you know, stuff like that. That's how he worked with people. So, you know, it, it's changed. And I, I just don't think that Urban Meyer – is going to be a successful coach. I don't think Urban Meyer is going to go back to coaching, but uh, you know, whatever. Uh, okay. You know, here's the thing about the coaching uh, thing. Do you want to talk any more about coaches right now? I'm, I'm talking about you. I'm talking as I'm much. trying to take, I'm going to take time off from talking about coaches. I, I'm, I'm more concerned with where the program is going to be right now in two weeks. I, I'm not throwing, away this season i you know what here's here's the bottom line as far as the coaches are concerned there's going to be rumors daily daily and some of them are going to be tongue-in-cheek and some of them are going to be people who are trying to get clicks and some of them might come from people that think that it's uh, something serious is happening trev albert said in his press conference that he was going to have a national search and he was going to talk to a lot of people He's going to talk to a lot of people. He is not going to make a decision on who this coach is one week after firing Scott Frost. He's not going to hire a coach or come to an agreement with a coach two weeks after Scott Frost is fired as the coach. This is going to be something that's going to happen in the back rooms over the course of the next couple of months. We'll know towards the end of the season who the head coach is going to be. And then we can talk about, did they make the right pick? There's so much speculation going on right now. It's hard to keep track. I mean, like I said, if you want to read about potential coaches, go to Corn Nation. He lists 21 coaches on there. Um, we all have our opinions. We all have people that we think uh, can do the job. I've expressed mine. I gave my top five the last week on who I'd like to see. Um, you know, we can answer some questions, I suppose. But, um, you know, we, I did see a question that popped up from that uh, Robert Noble that this is the most important hire that is going to be made for the future of Nebraska football or something along that line. I don't disagree with that. I think it's going to be an incredibly important hire. Um, so I'm not selling it short that we should accept anything less than – the best coach that we can find for the program. But, you know, we'll, we'll all find out <laughs> what's going to happen. Okay. You know what we're going to do, Todd? You know what we're going to do? What are we going to do? We're going to, instead of these people asking us questions, I'm going to ask these people a question. Who is the best or who is your, your favorite player to watch on this team so far? That's my question guys in the comments section. Is there any Husker players that you've been enjoying? Is there any Husker players that you thought were, were doing a good job despite the fact that uh, we're, we're not very good at all? Well, John, uh, let me pose that question to you. While we're waiting to hear from our listeners here tonight, who is your favorite player to watch? I, you know, I'm intrigued by Casey Thompson. 
You know, I, 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 the guy has almost no time. I mean, he's, wow, he's under a lot of pressure. Here's the guy. Wasn't he last year in the Big 12, like the, the leading quarterback? I mean, he had more passing yard. I mean, he was the top quarterback in the Big 12 last year. So he has competed at this level and done pretty well. He chose to come to Nebraska. And I, I guess I'm just, if Mickey, put it this way, if I think if Mickey Joseph could do one thing in the next two weeks that I would say you need to fix this the most, it would be get us at least one offensive tackle so one side of the line works. And when Casey Thompson needs to scramble, he can at least go, I'm going in that direction because that guy at least is blocking one guy. <laughs> because I think, if, I think if we can give Casey Thompson the chance to show what he can do, I think we can score points. And, you know, last I checked the uh, – Scoring points was uh, how you win the game. Kind of important, uh, yeah. Well, uh, I'll tell you what, my favorite, you know, there's a lot of people that have, have expressed that they like Anthony Grant. I like watching Anthony Grant play. But I'll tell you what, I think I actually like just a smidge more. I like watching A.J. Allen. I mean, that guy has got some quick feet. Um, he, he accelerates really fast. And I think he's kind of fun to watch. And, and somebody in the, in the comments has made said that rumor is is that he's injured. I hope not. <clears throat> but better now, maybe when we've got a you know an, an off week, so that hopefully he can get healed up. But uh, you know, here's here's another player that I enjoyed watching on Saturday. And and you know, it's not to contradict you know anybody, but I actually kind of liked watching Chubba Purdy play. Um, you know, Grant. And he was in there when the heat was off, so to speak. You know, it wasn't uh, – you know, the, the game was pretty much decided. That guy's an athlete, and he's a big, strong guy, and he's got a, he's got a good arm. And, you know, I, I think the future could be pretty positive with Chubba Purdy being the quarterback. Um, but, you know, as a lot of people are kind of alluding to here, you know, there is that cloud – you know, how are we going to keep all of these players around? Well, realistically, every school is going to lose players. I just hope we don't lose, you know, some of our top-notch players and some of our potential going forward. And, you know, that that goes into hiring the right guy to be the head coach and him deciding, you know, who, you know, convincing the people to stick around that he wants to stick around. Yeah, that's true. Wait, you went and answered comment questions. What questions? <laughs> It's hard to follow these things when you're looking at the comments and you're like trying to listen to you. And well, here's one for you. Do you think this is from CE? Do you think do you think Oklahoma is legitimate, John? I think Oklahoma has Brent Venables as a coach and can recruit at the level that maybe not Alabama, but they certainly can recruit with like Oklahoma or not Oklahoma State, uh, like up at the Ohio State level. I think Brent Venables is like five times the coach that Lincoln Riley was ever going to be. And that guy immediately makes them a legitimate can contender, just filling in the holes. Dylan Gabriel, I realize that our defense and everything we have is, is looks, you know, we're terrible, but I, I do think that, you know, they're number six in the nation. They belong there and they can move themselves up by just winning the rest of their games. Are they a contender for the top four? I'll just go ahead and say, yeah, because, I mean, if I was gonna, if you, if I was gonna root for an, a, a top ten team that wasn't Nebraska because it's not a top ten team, <laughs> I I I'd probably have to pick Oklahoma. I because I don't know who else to root for. Well, you know, I, I if we've been around the Big Ten long enough to the Big Ten hate has set in. You know. Oh, John. That goes against everything that's true about the Big Ten. I mean, what. The reason the Big Ten isn't the SEC is because we don't get along like all those SECs. We don't cheer for the Big Ten like they do in the SEC. What's wrong with you? We can't have Big Ten hate. Yeah, oh, God. You know, I so much want to do some videos about Big Ten hate, but, um, you know, maybe the off season will come. Uh, you asked me, Oklahoma, is Oklahoma legitimate? I, I think we'll we'll see the rest of the season play out, and I think that they'll just stay there at the top. Because again, Brent Venables is he's a damn good coach. They fell into 
Lincoln Riley leaving was the best thing that could have happened to them at that. Well, point. I think you're right, and uh, you know, for people who haven't been you know following it that close, Brent Venables has been in the in the minds of a lot of fans, uh, you know, a, a potential head coach for quite a few years. But Brent Venables made it very clear that he was going to be incredibly picky about what school he was going to go to or, you know, his list of potential schools was very, very small. Um, he wasn't just going to go anywhere to be a head coach, just to be a head coach. Okay. I th- Tyler O'Connor Smothers is a guaranteed transfer guy. You know, if I had to guess anybody that that would probably be him, I'd still like to see him get into game. You know what? I, I, I kept yelling at my TV against Oklahoma. Why don't they put Smothers in and run some option plays? I mean, it would have changed up the offense at least a little bit for a series, and you might have, you know, thrown Oklahoma into a little bit of a tizzy for at least one series. We could have seen something happen, and I bet no, that didn't happen. Uh, <clears throat> let's see. What else we got? Well, how much time do we have up here, John? I'm trying to look. We got about, we eight, about eight, eight minutes. Eight minutes. Um, let me let me. Um, we'll wrap this up with some football, but let me go down this road here a minute. And uh, you know, I'm gonna I, while we have uh, the air here, so to speak. Um, what has gone unnoticed by many Nebraska fans? Um, well, you know what? I'm going to rephrase the way I'm going to attack. You know, you see these things a lot where people come up with their Mount Rushmore. You know, what's Nebraska's Mount Rushmore for football players? You know, what's what's uh, Mount? You know, uh, whatever it might be. But if Nebraska had a Mount Rushmore for Nebraska athletes, I think a guy just had his head carved on that Mount Rushmore by the name of Jordan Burroughs. And oh, that's good. For a lot of Nebraska fans, they may not know who Jordan Burroughs is. Jordan Burroughs wrestled at the University of Nebraska and was a two-time national champion for Coach Manning. Jordan Burroughs this last weekend won his sixth world championship and his seventh world-level gold medal. He's got six world championship gold medals and an Olympic gold medal. That is the most by any American wrestler in history. It was formerly that record of six. He was tied with John Smith and a, and a female wrestler by the name of Adeline Gray. Jordan Burroughs is 34 years old, and he's wrestling as strong as he was when he was in, you know, as he did five years ago. The guy is incredible, and he's one of the best representatives of the University of Nebraska that's out there. He's one of the most respected individuals in the sport of wrestling. And, uh, you know, my hat's off to him because it is not an easy sport. And it's not an easy sport to continue into into your mid-30s because he's not getting paid, you know, million-dollar contracts like other professional athletes are in other sports. So my hat's off to Jordan Burroughs. He's a, he's a fine representative of the University of Nebraska. And, and uh, I'm very, very happy, very, very happy for Jordan Burroughs. All right, somewhere somewhere in here, Linda Wilkins asked about, there it is, what about Tommy Hill being benched? Uh, I didn't, you know, I know that there was some kind of altercation or something happened on the sideline where Tommy Hill was, I think, yelling at a coach or a coach was yelling at him. It, this, is part, this is part of what we're going to find out in these two weeks between uh, this, you know, Eric Shenander being fired in the next game against Indiana is – uh, who's going to be, well, if we, I'll just be br- blunt enough to say it. Who's still going to be on this roster? Who's on, who honestly is going to be with this team in, in two weeks and be on the field as starters. And I'm pretty sure that when Mickey Joseph is probably going to find out this week is if you're with us, you're with us, those guys. And then the guys that are like, yeah, no, I don't really give a shit. Uh, those guys can go sit somewhere. I don't know. Eat popcorn. I'm sure they still have access to the training table. Not the best food, though. But you know what I mean? That's probably well, what we're going to 
find out in the next week or two is is who's really uh, on the side of let's moving forward and getting better or I, I don't really give a damn and I don't care kind of guys. I will say this. I've, I've For whatever reason, when I've been in the stadium, I've kind of focused in on the corners and uh, mostly because the, the, both of the teams have just carved us up on those slants and that kind of stuff. Tommy Hill has has been beat um, or he's he's played way too loose um, a lot. I have, you know, is, is the, with all of the accolades that Tommy Hill was getting coming from spring and then, you know, into fall practice. Um, I, 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 th- I think I think there's maybe a little bit more to what's going on with Tommy Hill and his performance on the field than than anything else. You know, we're going to finish up with uh, Eric Smith's comment. The only way the offensive line could get worse is that they laid down before every play. You know, you were at the game, Todd. Do you know what I was yelling at my TV? Lay down, lay down. No, it was close. I, I kept yelling, could they just put a box in at right tackle? They could put a cardboard box, and then it, the rule would be, you can't knock over the cardboard boxes. You have to go around it. And then, you know, Casey Thompson would at least have one stable spot that he could, like, maneuver around and run defensive players into the cardboard box. And then that would be really good, better offensive line play than we are getting out of our tackles. God save the queen. Or king now, isn't it? It's king. Did you watch the royal wedding? Did you watch the royal wedding? No. I, Wait, I would, funeral, funeral. <laughs> you know, I, I, John, you know, I think we want to thank all of the people for tuning in tonight. There's been a lot of interesting questions and interesting comments. We can't get to all of them. Um, you know, we do appreciate people's opinions on, you know, who the next coach is going to be and and some of the wants and, and that type of thing. I mean, because we're all there as well. Um, I guess I'm just thinking that there's there's other things that we could be talking about because I'm not going to talk about coaches for the next eight weeks, but um, we appreciate you all being here folks. And, and we'll, we'll continue to try to get a little bit better at what we're doing here and bring more of your questions up to the surface if we can. So. That is, that's it. Isn't it? Uh, do we have a sign off for this that I, <laughs> I don't think so. You just Good night, it. John. Good night, Todd.